So you have algae. Now what? There's so much information about algae control that is so easy to get overwhelmed. Where do we even begin? Well, that's exactly what we are going to be covering in this video. A playbook on algae control. Identifying the exact type of algae in your aquarium is crucial. Each type has its unique characteristics and requires specific strategies for control. We'll dive into the common types you might encounter and focus on how to accurately identify them. Correct identification is the first step to effective control. Thread slash string algae. There are two main types of thread algae, green fuzz algae and green beard algae. Fuzz algae mainly grows on plant leaves, especially on old, damaged, and rotted leaves, and appears short with just a couple of centimeters in length. Beard algae is slimy and can grow up to a few centimeters. It also has a tendency to attach to plants as well as hardscape. Both of these will anchor very strongly to a surface, making it hard to physically remove. However, the threads of beard algae are quite weak. Diatoms, also known as brown algae and comes in two shades. One creates a slimy brown surface while the other comes in thin brown threads. Although diatoms can actually be green. What? This is why some people mistake diatoms for thread algae. Unlike firmly anchored thread algae, diatoms are relatively easy to dislodge, making physical removal a viable option. Black brush algae, also known as black beard algae. It appears black with a reddish or a blue tint and grows in small hairball clumps. It prefers places with a strong flow and can grow virtually anywhere, including equipment. Green spot algae is quite self-explanatory when it comes to its appearance. Another thing to look out for is that it is notoriously difficult to remove without a good algae scraper. It also mostly grows on a hardscape, glass, and on slow-growing plants such as Anubias. The dots can vary in sizes but are mainly on the smaller side. Green dust algae form a green layer mostly on glass and hardscape. The main reason for its name is that when physically removed, it spreads out like a cloud of dust. This is one of the only types that mainly affect high-tech tanks rather than low-tech, and is seen more in newly set up aquariums. Staghorn algae is sometimes mistaken for black beard algae. The main difference is that when observed more closely, it may appear more gray or blue, but with a branch-like shape. Staghorn tends to appear more on the edges of leaves and near the surface. It can also anchor down on a surface and be more slippery, thus making it difficult to remove. Green water is, well, green water. However, a lot of times people may mistake a bacterial bloom as a green water infestation. Although, having a greenish light may be the culprit in this misconception. Blue-green algae, also known as cyanobacteria, is a fast-spreading algae that mainly has a bluish tint. It can form a blanket or a spiderweb-like appearance over hardscape, substrate, and plants. One of the main identifications is the smell of a musty or swampy biome. Start with physically removing as much algae as possible. This will immediately improve the appearance of the tank and reduce the overall impact of the algae and its ability to spread. There are various tools that can assist us with removal. Scrapers are a blade that are mainly used on glass walls. They can be used on acrylic or plastic, but be careful as they can easily scratch surfaces. This is where sponges and brushes come into play. Specialized glass algae sponges or even a simple toothbrush allows us to clean algae from sensitive places such as silicone. On the other hand, tweezers can help when picking away at algae and tough to reach places or to push something to the side like a tongue depressor. However, some algae need specific tools to make the job easier. For instance, I recommend using a siphon while simultaneously scraping away green dust algae and cyanobacteria. The main reason is to prevent the algae from resettling elsewhere in the tank. Field brushes are also very effective on removing algae from hardscape, especially black brush algae and staghorn algae. There are also removal techniques, the main one being pruning algae infected leaves or weak plants in general. You can remove almost majority of leaves from a plant stem and leave any healthy growth, or you can just trim and remove the bottom. This will encourage the plant to grow more new healthy leaves. However, I have a technique where sometimes I leave the plant as is and not trim it until I see a good chunk of healthy plant growth. The main reason is that I don't want other plants to overshadow or overgrow it and prevent it from receiving any lights. One thing I really want to get across is that if you are fully removing algae infested plants, please make sure that you dispose of them correctly through freezing, drying, burning, boiling, you name it. You don't want to infest local waterways with invasive plants and algae. While physical removal is helpful, it is not the end all for algae control. It is mainly one step in the grand strategy. Algae can appear for a plethora of reasons. Some are similar while others are completely unique. But I want to state that the use of any chemical should be a last resort. This includes H2O2 and liquid carbon as chemicals may cause more damage than necessary unless you're dealing with cyanobacteria. The most critical factor in algae control is finding the root cause, not just to get rid of it. If you don't tackle the root cause of said algae, the issue will never go away. All you're doing by simply getting rid of it is the same as drinking soda when you're dehydrated. It's a temporary solution 
question that does not solve anything in the long run. This goes for the reliance of just using physical removals, nails, and shrimp, and even the blackout method. A blackout does not give any information on the exact reason why the algae appeared in the first place and can cause more damage to plants depending on the species and duration of the blackout. I'm not saying blackouts are useless. A great short-term solution, but you need to pair it with a long-term solution that tackles the root cause. Otherwise, you will be stuck in an endless cycle. This is the philosophy of how I'm currently tackling algae in my main tank, and I'm getting great success. The short-term solution is physical removal, while the long-term solution is finding out why it's showing up in the first place. I've been doing tons of experiments on lighting, switching from lean fertilization to EI dosing, increasing CO2, and things like surface agitation. I have made a complete algae guide that goes over the causes and treatments for each algae type. The treatments listed in that video are mainly long-term solutions, but there is one important factor that needs to be considered when applying those treatments. That is to adjust only one variable at a time. Doing so gives us the understanding of the exact cause of the algae type. Furthermore, you will not be stressing out any livestock and plants while you're only changing one aspect at a time. To go even deeper, we need to make these adjustments in a controlled manner. For instance, when adjusting lighting, change either the intensity or the duration, but not both at the same time. It's virtually impossible to figure out if the light intensity or the duration was the solution. Given how this is a long-term solution, it's best to keep track of any observations over a timeline. I personally use a two-week test timeline for a single variable and jot down any changes. Once we figure out a variable or multiple of them that make a positive impact, we can use these results for future referencing if or when the issue appears again. This obviously takes patience and time, which can be challenging when dealing with unappealing algae. However, I can assure you that the long-term benefits of this approach includes a healthier, more balanced aquarium, and the achievement and dopamine release of the victory and the knowledge gained from battle. This knowledge is not just solving a problem today, it's about preventing it tomorrow, which brings us to the next topic, preventative measures. This is the easy part once we take care of the algae. However, we still need to be on our game when it comes to maintenance, nutrients, lighting, feeding, stocking, etc. Persistence and consistency is the key in prevention, as well as quarantine. Yes, you should quarantine your plants. Don't be like me and not do it. To help us even further, we can introduce algae-eating livestock such as shrimp and snails, but not solely rely on them. This info is mainly based off of my own experience and research. If you have any comments on control methods that I did not mention, feel free to roast me or uh leave a comment for others to use in their toolbox. You can also join our Discord where we can all collectively collaborate with one another and rant on how much of a mistake getting into this hobby is. Just joking by the way. Except for the Discord part. Join the Discord. Should I restart my tank? This is a question that ponders everyone who feels defeated when battling algae. It feels like an unwinnable uphill battle that leads to nowhere. Even I have asked this question myself before, and the answer to that question is... It depends. There are pros and cons to it. Restarting a tank will take effort, and maybe even additional cash that you might not have. Furthermore, you'll have to go through the nitrogen cycle again. The algae will not also magically disappear once you restart. Any spores on the plants, substrate, equipment, and hardscape may be enough to bring the algae right back again if you don't don't take proper care of it. However, that isn't always the case. Restarting gives you the ability to practice any technique such as aquascaping or using different plant species. If you take the right steps, you could fully eliminate algae. This is exactly how my 12 gallon scape went. It was covered in string algae and as a last resort, I decided to restart it. In the end, it rarely had any algae issues. I made sure not to repeat the same mistake as before, which was fluctuating CO2 and high light intensity. Now, if you do take this route, it's okay if you feel defeated. You tried, you researched and applied different techniques. You may have lost this battle, but now you have the knowledge to win the next one. So give yourself some credit and be proud of how far you've come. But as always, there is still so much to learn, especially when it comes to knowing one of the most important aspects of any plant to tank. You can find out what that is in this video.